develops is an arms race between the citizen and the state. To my mind, the best example of this being played out right now is in China. China is a one-party state where for 60 years the Communist Party has ruled with an iron fist. Here the web presents both a massive headache and a great opportunity. China has more people online than any other nation in the world, 253 million. So the web's effect on politics is a huge threat to the state. And yet the technology has helped drive China's phenomenal economic growth. The Chinese state has to play a skillful game of cat and mouse with its citizens. This is a game that's defining the web in the 21st century. So you should... I think the attitude of the government is that they want to use the power of the Internet to boost the economy. But in terms of politics, culture and society, they are really worried about information on the web that can be a threat to them. They can't simply turn off the Internet because Chinese businesses live by export and they need to talk to Western customers. Chinese universities live by getting information from Western universities, by reading research papers, downloading lecture notes and so on, and they can't block that. They do want to block Falun Gong. They do want to block stuff related to the Dalai Lama. Um, so it's hard. The efforts China puts into censoring the web are staggering. An estimated 30,000 Chinese secretly police the web full time. The Chinese have become really adept in the last 15 years at what is widely referred to as the Great Firewall of China, right? This ring of censorship around uh, the kind of metaphorical edge of the country, which censors inbound professional media. So the Chinese will look at the New York Times and say, we're shutting off access or we're turning on access. They do it with Wikipedia and so forth. So it might appear that the massive investment the Chinese state has made in policing the web is paying off. They've effectively managed to block Western websites that might be critical of their policies. What we fail to grasp when we're wringing our hands about the New York Times or even the BBC's websites being blocked is that for the Chinese government, the challenge of the web isn't about liberal Western information coming into the country. They perceive the threat as coming from within, from the conversations that hundreds of millions of Chinese people are having amongst themselves. The most powerful and poignant illustration of this came in May 2008, when a massive earthquake in Sichuan wiped out 70,000 Chinese people. While schools collapsed, Communist Party buildings were left largely intact. Quiet outrage of ordinary Chinese on the web focused a new challenge to the authorities. The incidence of the earthquake was reported by Chinese citizens taking pictures of it and in some cases video of it and posting it in nearly instantaneously up on QQ, China's largest internet service, and out on Twitter. And this isn't media that comes from outside the country from predictable and professional sources. It's media that's generated inside the country, headed back out from half a billion amateur sources. In the case of no official media can investigate the school collapse issue, uh, many bloggers picked up that, particularly there's one Chinese artist, Ai Weiwei, uh, who is also a very known blogger. He bravely started a project of compiling all the names of the dead children uh, of the school collapse, uh, putting on his blogs. And then his action inspired hundreds of volunteers that actually went to the earthquake region, did the investigation, and compiling those children's names on their blogs. The government didn't like it when a huge number of volunteers went to investigate the schools that had collapsed in Sichuan. But my view is whether the government likes it or not, this spontaneous energy will grow and grow. But censorship is just one tactic employed by the state. China, like many governments, exploits the fact that citizens are putting more and more of their lives online. 
One of the biggest innovations in surveillance in the past few years has come about as a result of the spread of social networking sites and of social facilities and all sorts of other sites. Because once people make visible who their friends are, it's possible to do clustering analysis and start looking for covert communities. And this is an enormously powerful tool in the hands of the police and intelligence services in finding out who adheres to some um, particular disliked belief, be that Islamism or in China a love of democracy or whatever. Unable or unwilling to stifle all free debate on the web, the Chinese authorities are also using the web back on itself, harnessing its power to spread information instantly to wage a battle of ideas online. I think that if you can't block the internet, then you have to guide it. It's the only way. When a society is being pulled apart by the pressure of a rule, then you need to adjust your strategy. The government started recruiting what it called internet commentators, citizens who would write articles and post comments all over the web in support of the official party line. Ordinary Chinese dubbed them the 50-cent army because for each article or comment, they're paid the princely sum of 50 cents. It's estimated there are as many as 300,000 50-centers operating in China today. Censorship is two things. One is blocking and the other guiding. The so-called Fifth Center Army is more about the second method. Sometimes they need to effectively guide opinion in a particular channel or direction. But once again, the online community is wising up to the ongoing game of cat and mouse. Wen Yunchao used to be one of these 50 centers, but he's skeptical of just how effective the online spin really is. In reality, I think the effect of the 50 cent army has been exaggerated. We know that the government has spent a lot of energy in training professional internet commentators. They also have so-called part-time internet commentators. But from the internet, we can see that their force is very weak. Sometimes, on a website, an article is placed in a really obvious position. As soon as we see it, we know it's an article by a 50 center. So despite the Chinese government's sophisticated, nuanced use of the web, in the long term, the web shows a Houdini-like ability to escape any effort to constrain it. Countries that tend to be rather closed and where information flow was not very good have used the internet, in fact, to open up. And once you've allowed openness, it's very difficult to push it back. Well, the internet's certainly a force for open communications in China like it is anywhere else. And so the more it catches on there, the more they'll move towards a democratic type society, more in the model that we're used to. And fortunately that's happening as they're getting richer, as they're using technology, as they're connecting up to people around the world. That idea that you can really fundamentally suppress information is, is going away. We're beginning to see the rise of a political consciousness in many nations that have been repressed by dictatorships. It's interesting to me that both uh, Premier Wen Jinbao in China and President Medvedev in Russia are both now responding to bloggers on the web. Even though they are leaders within authoritarian regimes, they are now feeling the need to respond to this rising uh, political consciousness that is emerging on the web. While the battle between people and authority rages on, it seems to me that the notion of the state may ultimately be eroded by other forces at play on the web. Forces that challenge our real-world ideas of identity, of nationality, and community. The global reach of the web has provided enormous inspiration and power to people who, for whatever agenda, aspire to redraw the map of the world. The most important first attempt to 